Okay, so next, part B about this. Please look through this. So it's going to be at Intermountain Children's Hospital. Uh, what is it? Greg or whatever avenue. Rock Rock Street from Ashley Furniture and Bob, and Bob Wards. And Ashley Furniture is not open. It, I guess it's going to open again, but you can park there. And if you have any questions or issue about being there, please talk to me next week sometime. But it's a good place to take a test. I mean, it's going to be really, it's much more comfortable than in the cafeteria. Trust me. Because that was really your only other choice. Oh, thank you. All right, next. A a thesis statement. Now, the regular thesis statement, most of you did quite well on it. I have 9 or 10. I'm going to double in the grade books as we were 20. But most people probably have a scrawled letter. Why? Why? I need a stronger position. A stronger position you have to take. Most people had a good blueprint. If I put HI, that means more historical information. You need just a little bit more on the blueprint. Just a little bit more information. Don't just mention the Truman Doctrine. Say something about containment too. That sort of thing. Don't just mention fear of communism. Say, uh, because communism was unknown, or represented going to take things away, or communism as represented by Joe Stalin. Add a little bit more. And then those are the two things. Other than that, I thought they were good enough piece of statements that I think you would have got credit for it. Remember, I said a think because these are subjective. And then I gave two examples of thesis statements I typed up very quickly in class or in study all last period, second period. Analyze the factors that led to the red scare after what one. I gave two examples. And one is a very basic thesis statement that works very well. The red scare after, year, after World War II was caused by partisan politics. I addressed the question, and my position is it's politics. Politics in the U.S. And then I show my Republican criticism about the art Yalta, fear generated by the Soviet atomic bomb house in China, and driving Democrats being soft and communist by Joel McCarthy. I, I didn't just put Joel McCarthy, I had a little bit more. Does that make sense to everybody? That's a little bit more analysis. They emphasize that, just put a little bit more. There's a little more complex one. Despite the real fear of Stalin and the totalitarian state of the Soviet Union, so I have a paragraph about that. There are real issues of Stalin, the fear. The Red Scare in post United States was fueled by domestic politics. The Republicans accused the Democrats against the communism was personified by, by the McCarthyism. By the McCarthyism. I meant to put just McCarthyism. Like I said, I typed it up real fast, and I guess I was going to put the McCarthy era. And I didn't. But here's the best thing. Never happened. Okay. So, what's my first paragraph on that one? So I talk about the real issue. Stalin was a horrible dictator. Talk about Eastern Europe, the purges, etc. Then my next paragraph is going to be on the issues after the Cold War, from the Truman Doctrine, China, bomb, all those stuff where Truman was playing based off on communism, and then Hitler Parties. And when you think about it, in reality, those three paragraphs, good. Long, short IDs are essentially what we're doing. Tied together in some way, and you have a good asset. Now our magazines are here. Rest easy, everybody. But you want a position that makes it stronger, makes it sure they get it. But if you have a good, solid thesis, like almost all of you have, and then it, then get information down, basically your the body of your essay, which are in reality, short IDs. I think you're going to do very well on this. It's only one essay. You're going to get two choices. I'm sorry, three choices, I believe. And they're going to be relatively broad. So I think you have a good choice. That's one essay one. Mm -hmm. And then four short answers, which are great. We had, we had two essays. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you, they changed it. That's what it used to be for AP US history, too. And next year, AP Euro is going to similar to this. The short answer is basically short answers. Yeah, short answer, short IDs. But you're going to get like a little thing, and then on A, B, C, so like three mini short IDs for A, B, C. Or, yeah. Yeah. We've done a but we've already done a lot of those, and then there are some on the review test. Have you guys looked at your prep, your review books? They're very good, 
and they got four practice sets, lots of practice DBQs. They give you examples, which I don't think are great. I don't like their examples very much, but they do. They give examples. Yeah. Hmm? No. And I do have a grade. And it is not here. And you did well. But it's not here. I hit it at home. <laughs> no, I didn't say anything in a bureau. I have a whole stack of DBQs within at home, sitting there, safe at home, and I forgot them again. And yes, don't applaud. That's rude, right? Yes. Well, there's four short IDs, mm -hmm. and there's one DBQ is not one. The only problem with the short answers, which I think they're going to be, I think, I think you guys are going to nail them, except for one thing. You get no choice. You got to do all four. The odds are going to be broad enough. I think you'll be fine. But that's what makes me mad. I just don't know. Fifty-five. Yes. About four. Yeah. Everybody get there by seven forty-five. I'll remind you again at seven forty-nine. All right. Let's get to work. And I will review you lunch. So let's go take your notes out. Yeah. This won't be easier. You're gonna. It'll be a lot easier for you than the AP year old. Now this is old man. All right. So I will review at lunch, and then what time Sunday? Six. Six. What door? That one. Let's crawl through the window. Yeah, that one. That door. The door by right Mr. Murray's room, straight up these stairs, and facing the faculty parking lot, that first door. If you're going to be late, I can leave it open for a little bit, but I can't just let the door stay open the whole time because you're getting mad. <laughs> How long can you leave it open? Maybe 15, 20 minutes. That's it. Then I'll have to send someone out. If you're going to be late, either tell someone and have a call or text them. So you can click around and let you in, or you can come to my window and knock. Then I'll open it and let you listen from outside. Yes. Am I going to film it? I should. Yeah. But I'm giving up my time. If I do. If you're going to make it, please go. I get kind of annoyed if I give up my time on a Sunday to help you with a test that I did. No. Yeah. So, no. Sunday. At, Sunday at six. Seven forty-five to be there for the test. Sunday at six. I know it's at six, but I gotta do it then. No. I got. I know it's, but I. Got, I just that's it. That's the only time I go, so I'm giving up. All right, so let's go ahead then to get back. We got right to Guatemala. What country in '53 the United States overthrow? '53. Not Iraq. Iran. Iran. I know one letter difference. They're actually significantly different countries. The Q looks nothing at all like an N. Duh. So, what was Eisenhower's idea to use more nuclear weapons than conventional weapons? Save money? New look. New look. And he was going to use what instead of brinksmanship in a very complex world? Yeah, CIA and covert operations. So the first one was Iran. And Iran would have horrible implications to the future to this very day. Unintended consequences. Of, what do they call? Well, they call it unintended consequences of intelligent actions. Blowback. Blowback. Which question? Or they had a question. So Guatemala 54. Very similar thing. It was a democracy. And our, did I show you this? I don't think I did this, right? Our Benz democratically elected president of Guatemala, and instead of nationalizing the oil, he did land reform. And you'll notice something else. This is supposed to say United Fruit, but I left it up for that looks really funny. It's untied fruit. Or yes. I uh, it did Oppenheimer was accused of being a communist. The man who built the atomic bomb. That shows how crazy the Red Scare got. I just don't have time to talk about that. But our Benz was a nationalist. He wanted to buy the land from United Fruit. United Fruit had almost all the good land. Buy the land and give it to the peasants. So naturally, he's a what? Communist. And so the CIA created, the CIA stepped in, 
created a fake army under the leadership of where is my miles? They created a fake army in Honduras, a basically a bunch of thugs and peasants who didn't never fought a rifle before. Then they found some officer to lead them, a colonel by the name of uh, Valero Armas, and tried and overthrew Guatemala. It actually failed miserably at first, but Arbenz realized that he can't fight the United States. And Armas took power. So he just left. Yeah. He realized that a lot of reasons, but he realized that the U.S. is not going to let them survive. The CIA provided them with planes, Armas with planes, and bombed Guatemala City and Arbenz without planes. The CIA broadcast fake radio, fake radio broadcasts showing victory after victory of Armas's revolutionary army, which didn't exist. They even put speakers on the roof of the embassy and broadcast battle sounds through Guatemala City to panic the population. And nobody in the United States knew this happened. Everybody knew Guatemala. See, I was really, no one really knew this until 1976, for sure, that the U.S. did this. And our men's realized they're not going to say. What kind of government did Armas create? A horrible dictatorship that would last the late 80s. President Carter would begin a human rights a campaign in the 70s, and that was really kind of responsible for this, but Guatemala still is a desperately poor country. There's the fake revolutionary army. There's Armas being driven into Guatemala City. Huh? That's one of his officers. That, CIA. And so the U.S. now is overthrown, and I must add this. The U.S. said that our Mars was a Democrat, the moral equivalent of George Washington, they called him. But he was a dictator. And I'm going to make the United States look like hypocrites. When Nixon goes to Latin America in 59, he's going to be attacked. And people are going to go, why do they hate us? When the Iranian Revolution took place in 1978, they're burning American flags in effigy. Americans will be, why do they hate us? To this day, why do they hate us? These kind of things. Now, yes, it's their country, and they still have ultimately control, but the U.S. supports these. So, the U.S. also began, they literally called it Pact Mania. They made defense pacts all over the world. We already have NATO, but two more big defense pacts and other smaller defense pacts all over. Now the U.S. is committed to defend everywhere. CETO, Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. Like it? Great name, huh? All the countries in blue would join it. These blue countries were calling this stuff. They all joined it. And then CETO, for reasons that no one explained to me, CETO is Central Asia Treaty Organization. Why they don't call it like Cato, I don't know. It's Cento. And that would be here. Now, these were relatively short lived alliances. But the big deal is the US now has military alliances all over the world. CETO, CENTO, NATO. NATO is still around, the only one still around. That is the thugs and hooligans that all signed the CENTO agreement. It's all the presidents of various dictatorships in Central America. And the reason I put this map up. The blue were so-called allies, and the whole idea was to surround and contain these communist blocs, or as this French map says, bloc socialist. But while the U.S. is doing this, and it will relate back to CETO, another war was raging that in the 1960s would become a quiet mark for the United States in French Indochina. Now, French Indochina was obviously a French colony. Thus the name, French Indochina. Like it? Well, after World War II, the French wanted to reestablish their colony. During the war, actually, the United States supported the nationalist group that wanted independent countries in French Indochina. <coughs> These nationalists were called the Viet Minh. The U.S. supplied them aid. In fact, Roosevelt, before he died, wanted the French to give up their colonies and let them be independent. But then after the war, it became a Cold War issue. 
and the U.S. supported France trying to keep their colony because the leader of the Viet Minh was a socialist. Who was the leader of the Viet Minh? Ho Chi Minh. Remember, he was at the Treaty of Versailles back in 1919 trying to get independence, and they snubbed him. Worst kind of person? He's a teacher. Ah! He was a teacher and very a revolutionary. And that'd be cool if I was a revolutionary. No, I'm kidding. I'm too old now. <coughs> but you were so young and spry. Why so? <laughs> so, Ho Chi Minh, and we don't know what type of government Ho Chi Minh would have created. You know, that's, that's, there's too many what ifs there. But Ho Chi Minh was a leader, so it became a red or it became a Cold War containment issue. And so you have this ironic twist of fate where the United States, the country that fought against imperialism to become a country, is now fighting to promote imperialism and keep the French in power. Most of the Viet Minh were not communists. They were nationalists. And by 1952, the French were not winning. By 1952. The reason why is simple. The French controlled the cities, but they couldn't control the countryside. And by 52, it was really hard even to drive down they had paved highways. The French did pave a lot of their highways in their colony, so they could get the rubber out, really. Ambush, ambushes all the time. And so the French were actually kind of being isolated. By 52, they wanted out. The United States would then provide over half of the money for the French war effort. And they would have over 500,000 French troops, many of them were French Foreign Legion. We don't know how many, but at least 100,000 of them were probably former Nazis and SS soldiers that gave fake names and joined the French Foreign Legion. What a weird world. But in 1954, it's it kind of an act of desperation. The French decided to cut off a main Viet Minh supply line. The Viet Minh were being held by what country? China. China. And even though China and Vietnam hate each other, China saw this as kind of a political thing to help them out. Right here's a little, the main supply line for the Viet Minh ran right here. And there's a town surrounded by mountains called Dien Bien Phu. And the French parachuted soldiers in and took it. And parachutists work really well. Those are out of French transport plane, uh, Nordlas, Nordlas, French parachutists. The problem with parachutists are this. They land, they surprise, they take over land. What's the problem? It's a lot of water. Hard to resupply, and how do you get them out? They only had two helicopters. Helicopters are so new. So they had no way to get them out. They could get them in there, but then what? And Viet Minh surrounded them, surrounded the hilltops, and besieged it. And this became all everyone talked about in 54. Dan Ben Phu, Dan Ben Phu, Dan Ben Phu. With a French surrender, with a French holdout. By the way, that is why the United States thought they would win in Vietnam, or in South Vietnam. We had helicopters. We thought we could win with helicopters because we could get in and surprise like the parachutists them, but then get out. So back to this. They surrounded it. Eisenhower actually contemplated using American airstrikes, even sending American troops, and toyed with the idea of dropping atomic bombs. He even went to the Senate Majority Leader, who would soon become the most powerful member of Congress ever, and asked the Senate Majority Leader, would the Democrats support the US getting involved? And he said, no. That Senate Majority Leader was Lyndon Baines Johnson. As every Democrat did at this time, he copied FDR, so he went by LBJ. Why is that ironic? Say it again. And he was president when the U.S. got into the Civil War in South Vietnam. Ten years later, he'd be the one to commit U.S. troops. The irony is pretty huge. So, Dien Bien Phu fell. Hmm? Why would we want to get involved in a colonial war? It's a lost effort. If the France, if we, why would we want to help the French keep their colony? Does that make sense? But then, so in 1955, the French 
would sign the Geneva Accords with the Viet Minh. The United States were just observers. And the Geneva Accords ended this fight. The French left and created four new countries. Four new countries. Laos, which immediately began a civil war, and Cambodia. And then here's the biggie for our point of view. North Vietnam, South Vietnam. Four countries were created in the Geneva Accords. This is John Foster Dulles, the Secretary of State, and he's pointing at the, the line between it. They call it the DMZ or the Demilitarized Zone. It's not really that demilitarized. But in 56, the plan was for an election. North and South would have an election to unify the country. That was the Geneva Accords. Why did they even split it up in the first place? Well, they split it up more than anything else for administrative purposes, but also this was the French idea. The French were really worried about all of those people who helped the French or had converted to Catholicism. They were considered to be like collaborators. They were worried they would be killed in retribution. And so they wanted some place where they would be protected, especially in the South. So a lot of these people fled to the South, and a lot of people the Vietnam men went to the North. And then the idea was after tensions dropped, tensions dropped they could have an election. Well, very quickly, the United States realized if there's an election, Ho Chi Minh's going to win. And he's going to win hands down. The South Vietnamese picked a, a man who had hardly ever been in Vietnam. He had been exiled by the French. He was Catholic, which made him seem untrustworthy to the mostly Buddhist Vietnamese. His name was, all right, his name was Nguyen Them. You that. Seriously? <laughs> no, he just tied that <laughs> This is why it's, it was like them, it's them. When the Vietnamese were taken over by the, the French, going into the 20th century, the French brutally assimilated them. And the French made them get rid of their alphabet. Now, their alphabet was similar to the Chinese because the Chinese had been invading Vietnam forever. And it had 10,000 characters. So they took an alphabet of 10,000 characters and turned it into an alphabet of 26 letters. Do you see the problem? And so that's why you get all these different pronunciations for these Latin letters that we use and the French use. And so that's why you have Din, Bin, Fu, but that D is pronounced like a TZ, them. You can see how English speakers would have such trouble with, with place names in Vietnam. They would just kind of wing it. So, he's not communist though. And the United States told him, don't have an election. Don't have it. Get out of the election. Claim you didn't trust the, the North. Don't have the election because Ho Chi Minh would win. And once that happened, that would be the beginnings of the what we call the Vietnam War. Because almost immediately, almost immediately, civil war would begin in the South. Civil war would begin in the South. And right, the civil war in South Vietnam first. Civil war. Okay, so did the French cancel the election? Well, the French gone. So, so South Vietnam, the new government, South Vietnam, they just said we're not going to participate. No. Ho Chi Minh would have won, and he would have been the president of a unified Vietnam. So the U.S. started aiding Zem, and this is one that we have to get down. I didn't put it out there. And Zem joined CETA. He joined CETA. So the United States claimed that we were helping an ally that's being attacked. But in reality, it started as a civil war. Now, the Civil War, these are the two sides. I'll get to the National Liberation Front in a second. The two sides. The United States, supporting them, wants two Vietnams. That's the U.S. side. Two Vietnams. We want South Vietnam and North Vietnam. Everyone got that. That's what the Vietnam War was about. Two Vietnams. The other side wants one Vietnam. They're nationalists. They want one Vietnam, and that includes North Vietnam. That feels that they would have won the election, which they would have, and 
and they're actually the legitimate government of one Vietnam. So that's the war. In 1960, the North consolidated all the Southern forces into one group called the National Liberation Front. They denied they were in charge, but they were in charge. The National Liberation Front or the NLF. That is their flag. This is actually, this is actually the flag of a Viet Cong unit in 75 when the war ended. Actually, yesterday was the anniversary of Saigon falling. It's sort of real time. I can still vividly remember that. But, but uh, the North really ran. <coughs> Sam knew he needed American support. So to scare him, he devised and he came up with a nickname for the National Liberation Front. He called them Vietnamese communists, or of course, Viet Cong, which means Vietnamese communists. And that's where the name came from. Hmm? Viet Cong, yeah, communists. It's Vietnamese, so it's a kind of a bastardization of the Vietnamese word for communists. Viet Cong. And the Viet Cong are the same thing the National Liberation Front. Now, until 1965, even though the North tried to coordinate it, they, they were Southerners. Either they were people in the South when, um, in, from, um, people in the South who went North and they came back, or just Southerners. But then after six, after sixty four, into sixty five, when the U.S. started sending troops, the North started sending troops. So this was still kind of on the back burner, but it's erupting. One thing you have to get down, by 1959, the United States started sending advisors to train Zem's government. And the first American battle deaths would be in 1959. Because they'd be training them, going on patrols with them. And if you go to the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C., which was really controversial when that was made, they, they don't have them in alphabetical order, but they have them by year and when they're killed, when they're reported dead. So you have 59, just a few people. I think it's huge, and it ends. Unless you know when somebody died, hmm? unless you know when somebody died, then you're, you're actually they have a book, and so you can go find the name and you can look for them. It's a book. It's a book. I imagine it's on electronic now. Do when I was there, just a big. They had a bunch of these big, huge books, and you can find them on there. And be a lot of people, you know, like that. They put a piece of paper into a etch and they get the name. Yes, what was? Um, was controversial. We lost. And there was this whole stab in the back thing going on that America could have won, but they weren't allowed to. Still have, still people talking about today. And so that would be when Kennedy became president, North and South Vietnam, actually Laos is what everyone was talking about. But the North started infiltrating supplies and troops here, and the U.S. would finally dub this in 1960, this it wasn't really a supply line as we think about it, just a bunch of little trails. Anybody know what we call that trail? Ho Chi Minh Trail. And that's the, Viet, the supply line for the Viet Cong, Ho Chi Minh Trail. So we have to get that. Because <coughs> we're going to bomb the heck out of everything to get the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Yes, Dave? So the US just wanted to make it to Vietnam, so didn't they yeah. essentially win the state to submit? No, we lost. 1975, they unified. Oh. Yeah, so you get the. I know what you're saying in 858, but the war went all the way to 1975. So, one a couple, while this is going on, a bunch of really serious events happened, and this showed how volatile the world was and how scary the policy of brinksmanship was. In 1954, 55, 56, 57, so two separate times, the United States almost went to nuclear war over two little tiny islands off the coast of Red China, the People's Republic, that the nationalist Chinese held. Queen Moi and Matsu, nobody really even lived on them. There were a couple nationalist Chinese troops. This map is showing that the Reds are ready to attack. We almost went to full-scale nuclear war to protect these two islands that nobody lived in. And that should give you an idea of what it was like in the 50s and 60s, 70s, 80s. These things would come up and boom, we're almost on the edge of nuclear war. And it was actually really scary how close it was. 
56 and 57. We sent the seventh fleet, sent troops, but it showed the problems of brinksmanship. And then, French and China's going on. Guatemala just happened. We also have the um, Montgomery bus boycott. We're building the interstate highway. All these things are happening at once. The Suez crisis. And this was the first real instance that the kind of plan to get allies in the Mideast was going to fall apart. It's also called the Sinai War in 1956. Well, even though he's much more dictatorial, a follower of Mo, or a guy who idolized Mosaddegh, Gabriel Nasser in Egypt, try to nationalize the canal. I didn't put it down. Nationalize the Suez Canal. Now, Egypt was technically independent, even though Britain still kind of claimed rule. Nasser took power and said, we should be getting the money from the tolls for using the, using the Suez Canal. Well, Britain and France got the money. Britain got about 80%, France got about 20%, and they wanted to keep the money. Britain and France. So Britain and France went in cahoots with another country that was trying to solidify their southern border, a country that was only eight years old, Israel. And all three of them attacked Egypt. Israel claimed Egypt was about to attack, and they attacked the Sinai. Britain and France attacked, saying, we got to defend the canal. Now, Egypt was routed. Egypt was not prepared for war. They really had a very small trained force. But the U.S. was furious. Eisenhower was furious. Eisenhower was thinking, if I support this, Egypt and maybe Iraq, maybe Syria, they might become allies of the Soviets. He was really worried about that. And the Soviets made a big deal. We will come to your aid. And Eisenhower really got worried about this. Remember, they just overthrew, overthrew the government in, in Iran. And so the U.S. forced those three countries to give back the canal to Nassau. In the short term, it was a victory for Nassau. Britain and France were furious. And it didn't work. It pushed Egypt to the Soviet Union. And why? Why? Because Britain and France, they just saw it. Nasser saw it as they're too close to the United States. So they'll probably, all it takes is a different president, they'll do it again. And he also said, and he looked at Iran. And he's thinking, they might get me that way. Yeah. How did the U.S. force move the war? They just said, we'll cut off aid. Well, um, do you want us to pull our troops out of Europe? That's what it took. This would begin the process of France going through near civil civil war, coup. France almost had a military dictatorship in 1960. It, it's there's such an amazing history in this era. At the same time, Hungary <coughs> kicked out <coughs> kicked out the horrible communist rulers. This was the most brutal of the, of the satellite states behind the Iron Curtain. Threw them out and tried to put in a more moderate socialist government in Hungary. The United States encouraged them. The U.S. were sending radio messages. Have you ever heard of something called Radio Free America or Radio Free Europe? The U.S. had very powerful transmitters that were broadcasting propaganda in Eastern Europe. And we told the countries behind the Iron Curtain, these countries, if you rebel against the Soviets, what will we do? We will come to your aid. They did it. Hungary got rid of them, told the Soviets to leave, started to change their system. They even, this is in the street of Budapest, cut off the head of a bronze statue of Stalin. You see when it fell down, like all statues, when they fall down, their nose gets crushed. If you, you the statue is still in the uh, museum. It's a great museum in Budapest. They got this big statue. Wait, the statue of Stalin. Hmm? Is the statue of Stalin Calvin? No, that's all. Even though there's all these socialists, they have a great park of all these old Cold War era statues outside of Hungary. This huge field of them. They're really cool. 
They did. While the United States, they rebelled. While the United States, everybody's involved in the Suez crisis, the Soviets invaded. The Soviets, along with their other countries, they made them join. They attacked into Hungary. Here are Hungarians throwing rocks at Polish tanks, but Polish are part of the Soviet bloc. And here are Soviet tanks and Soviet armored personnel carriers driving through Hungary. They brutally put it down, killing over a thousand, arresting tens of thousands of people, and reestablishing rule. And what did the United States do? Couldn't do anything. Are we going to risk nuclear war for Hungary? And that showed the problem with the Cold War. You start making promises. You talk brinksmanship. What if they call your bluff? And that's what happened here. They called the bluff. So. Wasn't that the, wasn't that the big thing in the U.S. as the communist one? Yeah. But Eisenhower was so personally popular and there were other things going on that he would run re-election. But this will be fuel for the next presidential campaign. And then Sputnik. The next year, the Soviets launch a satellite. Now that is the replica of the satellite. We were doing that for prop for. That's how big it was. Just about that big. And a shortwave radio transmitter on a battery had a really low orbit, so it was really easy to see at night. Had a low orbit that went over the United States. The first satellite in orbit. Short shortwave radio could pick up kind of a beep, beep, beep as it went over. And that's all it did. No purpose. Well, it just showed the, the proof the rocket could get up to an orbit high enough. And the orbit didn't last long. It eventually degraded and fell in the atmosphere. And Eisenhower didn't make, didn't make a good deal about it. But what happened was panic. I tried to say, not a big deal. Congratulations to the Soviet, but we are ready to launch ours any moment now. But no. People freaked out, and the Eisenhower administration wrote, we have to do something. Well, the United States had two competing groups working on the satellite. This is actually stupid. The Navy team, with their German scientists that we, we brought over from Nazi Germany, and the Army team, who had better German scientists. And what happened? Well, Eisenhower announced that the Navy team is ready to launch their satellite. Nobody was more surprised by that than the Navy, who had never had a successful test of their rocket. The Army was actually much further ahead. So, a week and a half after Sputnik, the U.S. is going to launch their satellite. Does anybody want to guess what happened? I'll come back to that. It got up about two feet, then blew up. We look like idiots. But think about Sputnik. You can imagine all the names that are going to come out of this. Here's my favorite from the London Daily Herald, Flopnik. I also like Kaputnik. I thought that was a good one, too. Well, out of this, Eisenhower coordinated missile technology into NASA. NASA. What does NASA stand for? Natural Aeronautics Ever heard of that National Aeronautics and Space Administration? A woman who graduated from Capitals now is just been confirmed as second in command of NASA. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was in the paper yesterday, wasn't it? She was a, she was a, appointed by Obama a few months ago, but she finally got confirmed. And the big thing is, it, it began to coordinate space technology, and they would launch a satellite a year later. But the thing was, you got to know about NASA. Yes, the big thing was. To get into space, to get a satellite, then a, well, then for something, some kind of animal in the space that lives, at least for a while, and then a, a human, and then eventually get to the moon. But the big thing NASA did was test rockets. Because why were people so scared about Sputnik? If they could get a rocket to go high enough to get out of Earth's atmosphere and to go, go to orbit, that implies they can get a rocket ballistically aimed to fly out of the orbit, go, go out, of, out of orbit, and gone. No. <laughs> out of the atmosphere, go over the Arctic, and hit the U.S. with an atomic bomb. That's what everybody was scared of. Not so much spying yet. Spying would come, yeah. Where does Sputnik fall? 
what it's about. No, it didn't never fall blew up in Nazareth. Oh, it didn't. Yeah. And I believe over the Pacific, but I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. Why would you want to fire a rocket like that? Like, why would you need If you put it over the atmosphere, you can't do it. Well, and out of the atmosphere, it go a lot faster, and it's also more accurate. Who came up with like the idea of shooting something and like trying that? Where did that come from? Middle, the Middle Ages. <laughs> <laughs> when they came up with cannon. Yeah, remember, was it you could shoot the cannon off the mountain and get it to wrap around the mirror? Did they have that idea? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so back to this then. Middle East, European history up here. So, real quick. So, also, so the big thing that NASA does is defense. That's the big thing NASA does. That's part of the defense line. They're getting satellites up there for spy satellites and work on rockets that can hit Russia. Okay. Next, the U.S. began to emphasize science for the first time. Science education was mostly avoided, especially after the Scopes Monkey Trial, which is, we didn't want to touch science because we didn't want all this big issue. Well, the United States began to emphasize it. And there'll be a real push to bring modern science and modern math education, whatever that means, into American schools. So the first federal aid for education would come out of this as a Cold War issue. And same thing, there would be a backlash against the science in the 1970s. Very similar fundamentalist uh, Christians would get after science education, but that it would take after the 60s. So there's Stalin. Stalin, that idea of him taking over Western Europe. Here's the issue. This might shock you. It shocked everybody when it happened. In 1953, the impossible happened. Stalin died. He had a stroke. Remind me after the test. I will take a day, and I will tell you Lyndon Johnson stories, because they're awesome. And I can't tell you all of them, because this is a high school. What who's that outside? <laughs> they were fine. <laughs> yeah, you have to give milk for your parents. Uh, you're very crude. But also, I'll tell you my brushes with presidents, and I'll tell you about Solomon's death because it's a good story. That'll be it. We'll take the first day after the exam, and I'll just tell you stories. Yeah. Sound good? Yeah. Can we take the Monday after the exam? Yeah, that is Monday. first day is Saturday. Oh, you mean Saturday? Put your head down. <laughs> <laughs> Stalin died. And after a power struggle for three years, Helena Navy Nikita Khrushchev <laughs> became <laughs> premier of the Soviet Union. Now, unlike Stalin, he didn't have iron control. For the rest of the time of the Soviet Union, it wasn't like one man. It was more a group of people. It's called the bullet girl, but... And Stalin or Khrushchev was very bombastic. Khrushchev, there he is, beating a shoe at the UN in 1960. He brought a shoe in his pocket. And to emphasize the speech, he took the shoe out and started banging it on the desk. What year was power? He took power. It, it took about a year of a power struggle, but in 54, he took power. And two things happened with this. First off, he secretly denounced Stalin. He was a crony of Stalin, but he denounced them. And by the 1960s, they started tearing down all these Stalin statues. <laughs> and there were thousands of them. <laughs> and, like Eisenhower, he wanted to lessen the threat of the Cold War. Khrushchev realized that the Soviet economy can't handle the arms race. The people are starting to grumble. He needs to end it. But he's still got to look tough because... He just can't do whatever he wants like Stalin did. He doesn't have that kind of power. Why didn't he have that power? Because he, think of it as whether well, it's a Polar Girl, which was the group of the highest ranking Soviets. Think of him more as the first among equals. So he needed their support. Where Stalin, they were all cronies of him. So in 1959, actually, 59 Khrushchev even came to the United States. It was supposed to be a short trip, and you ended up coming here for 10 days or 12 days. Toured the United States. And the big thing was he was going to meet very quickly with Eisenhower because Ike, the general 
wanted to leave office as the general who brought peace. And so they agreed to have the first real peace summit in Paris. I love this picture. Here he is in the U.S. Cow. Khrushchev liked cows. He was from the Ukraine. Here he is. Does anybody want to guess where Khrushchev is? Disneyland, which was a couple years old, meeting American singer Frank Sinatra. American singer slash mob member Frank Sinatra. Why isn't that your background? Because I have Elvis. I don't like. I don't like Sinatra. That, Bobby Derry. You say math the not. Okay, so why was I so willing to have a peace conference? Because I knew everything the Soviets were doing. I, the United States has five ones. It's called the U2. U is just means utility, it's meaningless. And these U2 that started by the end of the decade could fly 65,000 feet above Soviet air defenses. And almost every place in the Soviet Union, the US, had taken pictures of. And their cameras were so precise, they could read the license plates off of cars from 65,000 feet. So the United States knew that the Soviets were actually in reality way behind. Now this is top secret. So I knew I'm ahead. Part of the agreement though for Paris is Khrushchev said, you gotta stop these flights. Khrushchev complained about the United States said, Soviet lies. We would never do such a thing. Well, of course you were. But the CIA asked for one more flight before the summit. It's going to be flown by Francis Gary Powell. 1960, flying from Iran. There he is before the flight. And with he had engine problems and a couple other issues, his plane was shot down. And even though he was supposed to commit suicide, he decided he didn't want to die, and he was captured. The U.S. claimed a oh, weather plane got shot down. Well, then they brought out the pilot. There he is. He had dislocated his shoulder. You can tell, Kench. And that's the wreckage of the plane. Still there. You see him in Moscow. It blew up the summit. Khrushchev was furious. This was huge because the chance for a peace agreement went away. And Eisenhower's terms actually ended closer to nuclear war than ever before. Especially when 90 miles from the United States shore, a horrible dictator that the U.S. supported, this guy named Batista, was overthrown. And who took power? Castro in Cuba. 1960 now, there's a communist 90 miles away. We didn't know if Castro would have been a full fledged communist. But he tried land reform like Guatemala, therefore he's a communist. And these would be the issues of the election of 1960. And the Cold War looked like it might blow up. And one place I did not mention, there was a series of confrontations in Berlin, and it looked like there might be one. So tomorrow I will finish this. I am going to review at lunch. If anybody wants to review, quick go. If you want to go get your lunch or whatever, then come back. Please do. And then tonight, I, I got stuff to do. I'm at Sunday, 6 o'clock. Tomorrow, 3rd, 4th, and 5th. After 5th, or after 4th, I will have pizza. I'm getting donuts for 18 euros, so maybe I'll queue up for donuts for 3rd, but I don't know. Can somebody hit one of my lights, please? I used to write everything. Yeah, I used to. I write like a story and they just write a like. That's what I do. I don't see everything. I would do an outline, but I wrote everything down. Um, you have this more quick sound Yeah. Are you talking about the ideology? I think I have the ideology. I'll put more ideology for. Uh, Where is it? Is it somewhere? Yeah, I think ideology is more for uh, sectional life. Oh, okay. And so here I'm thinking about. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> so the north and south, this is the basic thing is that the north, the, um, you know, that industry in Lincoln. And, industry and urban. Yeah. Okay. And on the south, the south is fighting on the defensive. Oh, okay. All they have to do is survive, that sort of thing. And the thing about working together, which is great, I think it is. But when you work with somebody else and you say, I'm going to look what you wrote down, still try to put it in your own work. Yeah, that's actually a good idea to work together. I, I, I highly recommend it. But try to put it in your own words because you remember it better. <laughs> if you copy, you don't remember it. Oh, I'm still filming. I don't want to film this.